And the guy is obviously a huge competitor. I mean, he's never retired from a match. We're talking about over 1,500 matches on tour. It's just insane. He talked to other players. They go, yeah, 20 grand slams. That's amazing. But what's really amazing is the guy's never retired from a match. All right, we are here. We are lucky to be joined here on The Slice. Welcome back to the channel. We are lucky to be joined today by Christopher Clary, uh, longtime legendary journalist from the New York Times and author of the new uh, biography of Roger Federer, the great man, the master, the long run and beautiful game of Roger Federer. Thanks for joining us, Chris, today. How are you uh, from San Diego? Stephen, I'm doing really well. Yeah, I'm just here between uh, San Diego Open, the new tournament. They had the ATP head here this weekend and heading to Indian Wells uh, probably tomorrow. So it's good to be back in California. This is where I'm from originally. So it's always nice to be enjoying the weather and, and the good tennis. Yeah, looks like you're looks like you're right at home. And yeah, it was an awesome tournament there in San Diego. Uh, one guy who was not there, Roger Federer. We're, that's who we're talking about today. Your book covering him, uh, you know, in, in the front pages, it says 20 interviews over 20 years of, of kind of detailed inside access to to one of the greats um, is what produced this book here. So I've been working my way through it. I told Chris before I haven't actually finished the book because I've been like, I don't want, <laughs> it's almost like one of those ones you don't want to finish. It's like, you know, I feel like when I finish the book, Federer's career is going to be over. And then I'm like, I don't, I, I just don't want that to happen. So um, anyways, I want to get some of your insights for the, for our audience, uh, kind of some behind the scenes of the book so they can go buy it themselves and, and kind of read through it. Like, like I'm really enjoying doing. So, you know, like I said, 20 years, uh, 20 interviews from covering a young, talented Swiss player. Kind of when did you know that, oh, this was a biography I'm making of one of the greatest of all times. I should be like organizing this and, and keeping it ready. That's a great question. You know, and uh, to be honest with you, I didn't really know that until pretty late in the game. I got to say, I mean, I, my, my life has been, I have three children, married, been juggling my career and my, my life off the court for many, many years, there just wasn't time for me to write a book, you know, it just was not happening. My, my job with the New York times has been pretty all consuming writing well over a hundred articles a year and covering all these tournaments and the big events. So I have to say, I think it really hit me pretty late. And I would say I had a series of time there when sort of after the labor cup started around 2017 and Roger came back from his knee surgery and played so well in that period. I think we were just in a sweet spot in terms of, um, I got a great access to him during that period. He was very forthcoming. I think it was a great time in his life, a great time in his, um, in his tennis career. Things were just going very well, and he was in a very communicative mood. And I think we just got a chance to sit down in a lot of in different places over a two- or three-year period there. And that was when I started to think, you know, this is really pretty amazing to have had this opportunity with this high-profile athlete, one of the best athletes of this whole era, as opposed to not just a tennis player. And I think he's been very... Uh, you know, forthcoming in these interviews and, and give it a lot of himself. And, and I think people are going to want to look back, not just at Roger, but this whole era in men's tennis at some point and really have a, have a good account of it. And I knew that based on my experience and just having built up to this over many years, Stephen, I, that I had had um, kind of a front row seat to it all. And I thought it would be, a, I'd have a big regret if I didn't try to capture it in some fashion matter was how to do it. Did you wait till they were finished? Did you wait till Roger was finished? I, I knew I would, most of my great, great, you know, interviews with Roger had taken over place over a 20 year period, but they'd been more dense at the end. But I would say uh, I decided for real, I was going to do it around 2019 um, after the um, Wimbledon final with Djokovic. Cause I felt then that he was kind of at the, his main body of work at that time was, was complete and it would be mm. a good time to start working on this. And then I had to go back and dig through all the interviews and the tapes and the transcripts and, and that was quite a job just to get things organized. I did not get it organized from the beginning. It, it all happened over about a six month period. I was going to say, yeah, that's uh, that's a lot from reading the book. That's a lot like the amount of detail you go into Federer's early career. Um, just like p even piecing the timeline together might be might have been a big job in itself. And then and then inserting kind of all the different interviews. And, you know, you're talking to like everyone in his life throughout throughout that period, which is which is really cool, which leads me to something else I wanted to ask about, you know, I think this is the most detail or most, you know, inside access I've ever seen from, from a biography of, of, of a tennis player. And I've read a couple of Federer, um, just how, what is, what is getting this type of access? Like, you know, it must feel awesome. Um, I know it's hard to do, especially with uh, a guy like Federer who might be the most sought after person in tennis. 
Um, what is it like getting that? And I guess, how does, how does some of it even happen? Like, do you have any funny stories of like getting set up for it, waiting in a restaurant for him or like, like in the, at the beginning of the book, waiting in a, in a car for him outside of, I forget where that was in South America, but yeah. So just what are those experiences like? Yeah. The car was, it was in uh, Tigre, Argentina near Buenos Aires, right? He was down there playing an exhibition series back in the, I guess it was 2012. Yeah. December that year against Del Potro. But, um, in answer to your question, there are, let me see here. I think there are four key words, the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> as charming as I may be, Stephen, yeah. Yeah. It, none of this was happening if it was just me, you know, trying to make it happen. It, obviously, the New York Times has a lot of uh, cachet and it's earned it over many, many more years that I've been working for them. And, and mm-hmm. that certainly opened the doors. I also worked for the International Herald Tribune, which you may not remember, but was the international version of the New York Times and the Washington Post for many years. I was their sports columnist based out of Paris and um, Sevilla and Spain. And so I really was already in Europe. So that was a big help because Roger Abbas is European and so is Nadal, so is Djokovic. When they started their careers, I was based in Europe full time. And so I was really, and really focused on tennis. So I think being over there, being able to sort of at a short notice, be able to get places was very helpful. Right. And also, you know, I think Roger, uh, Roger has had some good books written about him. Obviously, Rene Stouffer wrote a great book about Roger early on in his career because he was a Swiss journalist who followed him from the start well before I met Roger. But I thought what I brought was I saw his pro career really from the very beginning uh, from up close. I didn't get a chance to talk to him in depth until 2001. So the first couple of years, no, I'd saw him a little bit more from a distance, but from that period on, it was pretty steady all the way through. And it was just, um, it happened all kinds of ways. It happened through the ATP kind of deciding to have at a moment that free, could you do it then? It happened more organically when I think he was ready to talk and I was the right person. This was talking about an era before the social media changes came along when players could go directly to their publics, which you know very well about uh, back in the beginning of Roger's career, even though it it's hard to believe probably now those tools did not exist. And so if you had a big story you wanted to break or something that was going on, that was confusing. I remember when he had uh, mononucleosis at one stage, which was hurting him and he hadn't talked about it publicly. Uh, there was a feeling that he was declining, that he was had lost his edge. And I think he wanted to uh, dispel the, those rumors and explain what had been going on. So instead of posting it in on a Twitter message or Instagram, he went through me in the New York times and we talked about it and, we ended up breaking the story about it. Right. So that was a different time. Those things could still happen, but I think that's much rarer now. Athletes will tend to uh, go directly when they have big news to share and then maybe discuss it afterwards. So that, that was part of it as well. There was a desire to create, a, uh, I think, a relationship of trust and respect and you know, with journalistic distance always on my part because of my job, but you know, being able to know that I would be there week to week or month to month or year to year. And also I had worked uh, Roger's agent, Tony Godsick, who came along with IMG around 2005, I'd say 2006 in that range there, with somebody I had worked with before. He was Monica Sellis' agent and Lindsay Davenport's agent as well. And so I had already established a connection with Tony uh, through those uh, those players and interviewing them as an American journalist. And uh, so I think when Roger became part of his team, then the connection with Tony helped me to get some access to things that I would otherwise not have gotten. But ultimately, you know, Roger's the one deciding what happens and doesn't happen. And so he, we had, I think, a good connection and wrote a lot of stories about Roger over the years. And uh, it just kind of feeds on itself over time. Yeah. Like that's, that's interesting. You say like back in before the social media age, like would that have been like Feder being like, look, I got mono. It's 2008. Like, I'm just going to call up Christopher Clary. And like, I'm going to get the story out, like, or is like, would it be his agent or maybe Merca reaching out to you to the New York times and requesting a kind of a, Hey, let's have a chat. It's funny. Cause in the very early years, Merca was the one organizing all his press, which is also right. hard, to, hard to believe now, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it was Roger and Tony, I'm sure Roger and Tony work kind of as a double headed organization in a lot of ways. The two of them get together. What are we going to do this? What's the strategy? And I think that was what it was. The two of them, what's the best way to get the message out? At that time, you know, New York Times, the International Herald Tribune had that broad reach and we were associated with tennis, as we still are, to be honest. And um, mm. I think that was the, the path they chose because they knew, also knew they would get a you know, detailed, balanced, uh, you know, objective story about it. And that's what they were looking for. Yeah, for sure. The obviously being so close to his career, like you have so many great stories, which are which are in the book. And I won't and we won't play uh, spoilers here because we want people to go get the book. 
Um, but there's some amazing stories. Do you have any kind of top stories that, or maybe like one story that you want to talk about? I was, we were talking before earlier about how you know, Federer, I think, beat Agassi. It was the 2003, I think, Houston. It's like the, the version of the ATP finals then. Um, he had some pretty interesting comments after the, uh, after the match to his coach, his then coach, Darren Cahill. Maybe you could touch on that. Yeah, that is a good story. I mean, it's a very, it's reflective of how tennis operates. You know, it's a bit sort of one generation establishes itself and then what comes next. And you know, Roger had taken a little time to emerge after beating Pete Sampras at Wimbledon fourth round 2001, as you remember. But I think he, uh, by 2003, when he won Wimbledon, he was really cruising and hitting his, uh, his mature tennis phase. And Andre had played, you know, Sampras for many years and Becker, Edberg, all these great players. And um, he played him in Houston. Actually, Andre beat Roger in their first match in Basel a couple of years before that. So mm. he'd seen Roger a bit from the beginning of his process as a pro. And Andre was in the locker room after the match in Houston and uh, Cahill comes in kind of uh, ready to give him a pat on the back and we'll get him next time, buddy. And looks down at Andre's just really got his head down and not at all looking like Andre normally would even after a loss. And Andre, um, Darren pats him on the back again, says, Hey man, it's okay. You know, we'll get back at it and lots has been going on and you're going to be able to get back at this. And, and Andre sort of slowly turns around according to Cahill and says, no, man, this is different. This one's different. This guy is changing the game. He's going, he can go places I can't follow, basically. And uh, coming from Andre, who was a competitor and also a resilient guy and been through a lot, that was quite a statement. And then I think you and I were talking about this earlier, Stephen. It's true that to me, the thing that's crazy is that was 2003. And then that was the new guy deservedly seen that way with all his complete game and his tool toolbox so full and his flow and everything else. And then who comes along just a few months later in Miami, 2004, Rafa Nadal and beats Roger in their first match kind of. And if you listen to the commentary on that match, people are just shocked by that. Yeah. They, just, they just can't believe this guy's emerging before their eyes. And obviously Roger had plenty of great dominant results on hard courts and grass for the, you know, the years after that, but already there was somebody in his, uh, in his view, who also was part of that, that game change. So it's interesting how it works with tennis. And so you, you think the next thing is there all by itself, but though it tends to attract other players of, of great quality. So, but Andre's was a great story. And there's another good story in the, in the book about early on, if that's where you are, which, which really hit me. Roger told me this story, I think in 2019 in Switzerland, where he was, uh, had just decided to be a pro tennis player. He was like 16. had just decided to leave school and uh, give it a go. And that's not typical for Swiss culture at all. Not typical for a lot of cultures, but really not typical for Swiss culture, which is more conservative, follow your path, make sure you got your backup plan secure. And he was going to his family dentist in Basel. And uh, the guy was working on Roger. Roger says, in my mouth, I'm trying to talk to him, uh, which is always the way it works with dentists, right? Yeah. And, and he says, uh, so what are you up to, Roger? And Roger's like, well, I'm playing tennis. So, I said, so what else are you up to? Roger goes, no, no, that's, that's really what I'm doing. I'm playing tennis. <laughs> and the guy yeah. just, Roger said, the guy just couldn't accept that. It was just really, I mean, we're, what, what, is that what you should be doing? Or you know, that's, is that the right move for you? And you got to be sure of you your future and all these sorts of things. And Roger says, you know what? I never went back. Yeah. It makes sense. I, because he was, I, he wanted the positive energy. And if you know, Roger, and you see how he's taken his career from then on, it's so important to him. He likes I don't think he minds hearing constructive criticism, but he likes people who are positive, who are constructive and uh, that kind of negativity. He just didn't want it. He didn't want to be around it. And, and he decided to sort of forget the family dentistry and all that. We're going elsewhere. And it's a small thing, but to me, it was, it was very reflective of, of the person as, as a whole. Interesting that you say that. I like the, the positive energy because the transition in his career of his, of his mental game on court to, like now, since I started watching him, which was t- 2009, I've obviously gone back and watched all of his early stuff, but he, he was like the ice man on court. Like I couldn't relate to him on court in any way. Cause when I play, I'm emotional. I was like, I was like when he was, when he was 16, right. He was throwing my racket, get all upset. And he seems to be able to find, and I've even heard on interviews after, you know, really tough matches, even like the 2019 Wimbledon final or, or the 2017 Australian final, when he was down three, one to Nadal in the fifth set he's able to find these positive avenues to go where as 
as a fan, as his fan watching him, I'm not seeing anything positive going on. I'm just like, this is bad. You know, it's, do you have it kind of maybe later on in the book or later on in his career, have you had any little insights into how he kind of, how he's able to turn his mind onto like the ways out of a problem rather than just looking at the obstacle in front of him being like, man, I'm up against it. Well, I think he's created, uh, took him a long time. Um, that sort of 98 to 2003 period, which I talk a lot about in the book, I think was in many ways the most critical part of his career. It's when he was able to you know, figure his game out and also figure out his mind and figure out his on-court demeanor. All those things were really important. And uh, obviously during that period, his, ch- his childhood coach, Peter Carter, died in the accident in South Africa, which was a huge moment in Roger's life. And I think gave him you know, motivation and direction going forward to to honor Peter's memory and honor who Peter was. It was also part of his mental uh, changes and his and the way he constructed himself. But I think he needed over that period of time to develop tools that allowed him to stay fully focused and in the moment and to uh, not express some of the negative feelings that tennis was making him feel. Yeah. And some guys, you know, they don't need that to play their best. I mean, you, a guy like Djokovic, you can still see, I mean, he, he does have moments where he's pretty Zen-like on the court for extended periods, but he, you look at sort of the arc of his normal season, they're going to be blowups or even his normal tournament. And I think he, I think he needs those and he can manage those and, and kind of come down from that and, and go on and play. But Roger discovered, I think pretty early that didn't work for him that he would just, it would just throw him off once he, once he let that energy come out in a very negative way, or he would, he would allow himself to, uh, to crack in a match. It was hard for him to kind of reconstruct himself. So I think he felt that he needed to, to find a way to, um, to keep that inside. And yet, find a way to use the energy and express it as well on the court instead of just tamping it all down. Cause he said for a while, when he first made the changes in his behavior and stopped shouting and throwing rackets, he felt like he was almost part of him was extinguished. Mm. He just didn't have the fire in the matches that he needed. So it took him some time, I think, to find that internal balance. We can't see that obviously he's only, only he knows what that balance is like, but it took him a while to figure out how to get that just right. And around, and he says 2003, you know, he lost, I think, in the French Open first round that year before he won Wimbledon and was sort of struggling that season. And that was part of the struggle, was trying to figure out how how to find that balance of play with fire, but not show it. Right. And uh, I think that's something he's gone back to again and again throughout his whole career. And the guy is obviously a huge competitor. I mean, he's never retired from a match. What are we talking about over 1500 matches on tour? It's just insane. You talk to other players, they go, yeah, 20 grand slams. That's amazing. But what's really amazing is the guy's never retired from a match. So you cannot possibly do that. Obviously you make your choices about when you play. That helps. You're smart about how you handle yourself off court in terms of your training and your fitness, but really that takes guts and just this competitive desire and sort of high level of pride too. You're not going to show the other person. You're not going to give them that satisfaction. And you have something, I think he's very proud of that, of that statistic. And uh, so I think he's channeled so many things inside into his tennis. And it it is funny talking to people of your age for the book. It's been really striking to me, you know, young, talented people who are getting into tennis journalism or podcasters, that part of Roger's career when he was volatile, they don't remember that. And so for them reading the book, I'm actually really glad I focused on it so much because I think for people my generation, it's more known quantity, but I was very curious to go back and dig into some of the details of it. But for people your age, it's really a, it's a revelation to see how he did it. And I think it, for all of us, to be honest with you, it's one of the, it's helpful too, to see how he did it. Totally. Because yeah, when I started watching, like I said, Federer, I was like, wow, this guy's like, he's almost like a God out there. It's like, I can't relate. His greatness is like, he doesn't get emotional in the same ways. He doesn't get affected, but he misses a shot. It's like next shot. Okay. Winner. But now looking back and going even to watching some of those things is like, I can relate to that. that. That's where I'm at, except minus the skill, you know? And so maybe for any of us in any, in any walk of life, whether it's not even sports or anything, if you're doing something and you're not excelling at it, there's, you've, you can see how one of the best of all time to do it, you know, had to, had to get that way and had to work to change to become that way, which is, uh, I think that's a cool narrative. Yeah. And I think Stan Vavrinka said this a couple of years ago about Roger and Stan obviously knows Roger much, much better than anybody else in a lot of ways in the tennis world of you know, fellow players. Uh, he said, Roger's great skill is his ability to give his full attention to whatever he's doing. And that's what I'm trying to learn from, is what Stan said. Mm. And I think that's very true. I mean, he's very present. And in a world that we're all living in, which is anything but about presence, 
so many yeah. distractions and everything else. I think that's, that's quite an achievement in itself. And, and Roger was not always that way. I think that's a developed skill. Um, he's always liked people and he's always enjoyed, you know, that kind of contact. He's a natural extrovert who also, as he once explained to me, needs his time away uh, to kind of recharge. But when he's out there, he's in that mode. He's very uh, gregarious and extroverted. But I think um, he's somebody who's able to change that chip. And when he's with you or the sponsor or the match or the practice session or whoever it is, he's there. And that's something, I think that is something very achievable for all of us to work toward. And I know it's something I could use some help with in my, in my career too. A little less Twitter on deadline. Yeah, it's same. It's, 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 I feel like it's even gotten worse now doing the work, the journalism from home. It's like I'm sitting, I'm watching the match or the press conference even there. And I, you know, you could just look at your phone or it's, you can get distracted by so many things. So that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting insight there. And that's true. I, I, I did get to talk to Federer one time. It was at the Miami Open that, which I was telling you about. And it was in the little, the little media day press huddle. And I was, it was kind of like a, a new stadium. So it was kind of a made up place to go. And we, I, I was the first person to sit down on this couch and then ev- all the other journalists gathered around me. And then he came and sat down, like, you know, arms reach away from me straight. And then they were like, okay, go. And I just asked the first question and got it in there. It was about how he can handle losses. Like he just lost a team, I think in the, in the Indian Wells final, they came to win Miami after that. But, and he was just like, when he was looking at me, I was like, man, I've got this, I've got this guy's total focus. And it was, and it was, mm-hmm. his answer was in depth and it was like thought out and yeah, it was a uh, very wild. So that, that's a nice uh, anecdote into his, into his uh, focus and how that can be kind of gotten better at. Um, but anyways, Christopher, thank, thank you so much for coming on the show, talking about the book. What are, you know, I guess the book can be bought anywhere that uh, people buy books. Well, I'm, this is kind of my personal feeling about it is that you can get it a lot of places and of course you can get it quickly on Amazon or, or online or, but I, I'm, I, I'm an old softy. I love in an independent bookstore. So if you don't mind spending a couple more dollars, you know, I'd love to encourage people to go to their neighborhood bookstore and, and get it there. Um, it's really been widely distributed and widely available in a lot of places. One of the cool things, Stephen, about the book is that it's, um, it's been translated into uh, 16 languages. So wow. it's, avail- it's available in a lot of different markets and a lot of different places. Some of those are going to come later in the process, but it's already out in a lot of countries. So I just hope people, you know, support their community and me as a, a total book lover and, and book nerd and all that. I just loved hanging out in those kind of bookstores still do. So let's keep them going if we can, if people are up for it to uh, try to buy their book there. I love that sentiment. You know, if you're in Victoria, like I am Russell books, go down there and get it. They are uh, a nice independent bookstore here and congrats Christopher for the, uh, for the accolades on this, I, I hear, is it a, is that true that it got into the New York times bestseller list? That is true. That was definitely a lifetime highlight for me. So that was very cool. As, especially as a New York times uh, correspondent. So yeah, it's, it's done really well. The response has been super gratifying. And uh, I put a lot of, a lot into the book. I mean, not 20 years of reporting, but also I went for the book. I went back and talked to more than 80 people uh, just for the book itself, which took a long time, but it was one of the most fun things I've done in, last few years to really get a chance to go back and look at Roger with a long view, with a lot of his coaches and a lot of people that are close to him. And uh, so I'm really, really, it really means a lot to see people's reaction to the book for me. Yeah. It must be super gratifying to even, to even just be able to hold a piece of your work. You know, a lot of yeah. our, a lot of our work is on, you know, it's on digital. It's so you can't hold it, touch it a lot of the time, but that must be really cool. And I think if you're just a tennis fan in general, maybe not, even, if you're watching the slice and you're not a tennis fan, it's like, you're probably, my family, but uh, if you're a Djokovic <laughs> fan, if you're a Nadal fan, if you almost, you, if you like cheer against Federer every time he plays, you should still buy his book because it's got such an amazing insight into tennis in general. And, and you go into depth about Nadal's career, Djokovic's career in different ways. Um, so it's an amazing book to get. It's relevant to everyone across the fandom of tennis. So thanks again, Chris, for, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Hey, Stephen, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it too. Of course, you're a long, you're now officially a friend of the show, a friend of the slice. So I'll be claiming that for for all time whenever we uh, whenever we meet up or see each other at a tournament. So that'll be great. Good luck with everything. <laughs>